Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'm Viraj, so I just wanted to introduce panel two. Um, so one of our speakers is going to be Daniel Hanley. He's a senior legal analyst at the Open Markets Institute. Um, his research and writing focus on the relationship between technology, antitrust law, legal remedies, and political economy. Um, before joining open, mar open Markets, Hanley inter interned at the American Antitrust Institute, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection. Um, Hanley's work has appeared in Pro Market, Competition Policy International, the Connecticut Public Interest Law Journal, American Prospect, and our publications. In February 2020, he was profiled by the Yukon Magazine um, and got his BS and JD from Yukon. Uh, congrats on the Huskies National Championship. Um, William Kovacic is a global competition professor of law and policy at George Washington. Um, prior to that, he was at George Mason. Um, and from January 06 to October 2011, he was a member of the Federal Trade Commission and chaired the agency from March 2008 to March 2009. He was the FTC's general counsel from June 2001 to December 2004, and in 2011, he received the FTC's Miles Kilpatrick Award for Lifetime Achievement. Um, at GLU, Professor Kovacic has taught antitrust, contracts, and government contracts, and has had numerous publications since returning to GW in 2011. Um, Dr. Nathan Wilson is an executive vice president with Compass Lexicon. Uh, since joining Compass Lexicon, Dr. Wilson has advised clients on antitrust issues in a variety of industries, including healthcare, tech, telecommunications, agriculture, and consumer products. Uh, he also recently testified before a state regulatory body on the beneficial aspects of a health systems expansion plan. Um, would be glad if you guys could join us up here and looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Uh, we are unsupervised, um, which is a dangerous step, to be sure. But uh, we're going to carry on the conversation among us. And uh, really delighted to the to the editors of the of the of the journal. Thank you very much to uh, to the whole team for giving us the opportunity to do this. To George and all of his colleagues for the pleasure of participating in this uh, wonderful event today. Um, uh, Nathan, Dan, maybe we start with one of the first questions that uh, we're going to address, which is, what, uh, what should guidelines try to accomplish? What's the point of having guidelines? Uh, what should motivate the formulation of the guidelines? And as part of that, how much do you have to stick with the jurisprudence that's been developed? Uh, how much do you stretch? How much do you sustain from the past? What should go into your mind in writing guidelines? And, and uh, again, really delighted to be here with both of you. Dan, can you, can you kick this off for us? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you so much again for the invite um, and a very warm introduction. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I, I, I want to get to the heart of the question, which is about the guidelines and what should actually be guiding them. <laughs> and. For me, the way I think about this is first, understanding just the importance of merger litigation. Mergers really are the, uh, or merger uh, enforcement rather, is really the primary way of how the United States government, private parties, uh, state AGs, deconcentrate and prevent concentration in the United States economy. It is the area where, that, that is really the least uh, untouched in the recent jurisprudence, uh, Cases from the 1960s, as the ones that have been named previously throughout this discussion, Brown Shoe, Vons Grocery, those are all still controlling. Um, and unlike, if you say, Section 2 of the Sherman Act, for example, there's been a lot of case law that's really uh, attacked at that. Uh, you know, Trinco, Link Line, uh, Weyerhaeuser, to name just a few. So uh, it, mergers are really, really an exciting form of regulation and enforcement, and they really are the primary way. Um, and so for me, that adds to how important the guidelines really are to projecting the government's enforcement priorities, how they end up uh, viewing their role. Um, and so to get to now, to get to the heart of the question, for me, the way I think about guidelines is they should really be articulating a couple of things. Number one, what is the controlling law? How should uh, how, do the, how does the government look at those cases? Again, 
Brown Shoe, Vons Grocery, Paps Brewing, there's a bunch of other cases. Explain that to the public in an articulatable manner. Uh, and what are, they, what are those cases trying to do? I would then say another uh, factor is the, um, the actual text of the statutes. What do the statutes require? Plain language, uh, maybe, tend to, uh, <laughs> maybe substantially less of competition tend to create a monopoly. What do those mean? And obviously then you would base that off of what the jurisprudence says. And then the third thing that I would say that is probably of paramount importance given the, um, the lack of explicit instruction from Congress in the statutory text is the legislative history, most specifically the 1950 Selleck-Kafauver Amendment. What were the concerns of the lawmakers? What were the overarching themes? And the guidelines can actually do a lot of effort to articulate, again, clearly to the public, what the, uh, what the drafters were trying to do. What were their concerns? And then use those, use uh, what the members of Congress were saying in line with the jurisprudence and the statutory text to create an enforcement set of uh, enforcement guidelines that effectuate all of those things. So I could talk more about what I think about those cases and other things, but I just want to answer the question succinctly. Great. That gets us off to a great start. Nathan. Thanks. And uh, thank you, uh, as Bill and Dan have mentioned, to the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Um, as I believe the sole representative of the dismal science here, I'm going to take a bold stance and say, I think the guidelines should get the economics right. I think, I don't mean to suggest that case law is immaterial. Clearly, the guidelines should be a useful document. But in articulating how the agencies approach an investigation into a merger, it should make clear why are we worried about the potential for harms from the deal? What are the types of evidence that we look for to substantiate or you know, wave away those concerns potentially? And you know, kind of walk through the various pieces of the analysis that an agency would be expected to do, ideally providing clear language that could be relied upon both by judges um, and also, uh, you know, I say as someone who did this with some self-interest, you know, I think it's nice to be able to, as an expert who's testifying, to be able to say, look, here is some excellent clean language that explains an example of problematic behavior. And I think it maps very cleanly to the specific facts at present in this transaction. As a result, it's not a crazy inference to draw your honor that there's a problem here. Um, so I think that the guidelines should are properly thought of as a very pragmatic tool that encapsulates kind of the, you know, the, I would say not the, I wouldn't say up to the vanguard of, of our understanding because I think that's too fresh. This should be a consensus document that right-minded folks of all perspectives can largely agree on the, the concepts and theories even if they're going to disagree about whether or not those perhaps apply in a particular circumstance. That can then be you know, used in proving up a case if you're the plaintiff or rebutting it if you're the defendant. Like it should be an equally useful document from both sides in terms of reaching a decision that we think is going to be better for the economy, either by uh, forestalling uh, some sort of consolidation that is likely to disadvantage consumers in some way, or in making sure that a potentially pro-competitive transaction is likely to result in synergies in either costs or quality uh, does get through. Thanks very much. I'd be curious to hear how you see it, Bill. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add to, uh, to Dan's and Nathan's comments that uh, uh, we might identify several different audiences for, these, uh, for this document. Uh, as Dan was suggesting before, uh, the courts are a crucial audience. Uh, these documents aren't law. They're not promulgated as regulations. They are statements of enforcement intentions. So in that sense, uh, they're not at all binding. Uh, they don't bind the courts, to be sure, except through their persuasiveness. Um, but with the courts, they've been enormously influential. Uh, it's striking to see how often 
uh, the framework has been embraced by courts. Courts will always preface their comments by saying, we don't have to do this. Of course, they don't. But we find this useful uh, as a, as a, as a uh, approach uh, to, to, to analysis. And I, I suspect the, the fact that they have embraced these approaches so willingly and extensively, citing them in their opinions, uh, everything from cases like H&R Block, Staples, all the way through to the present, uh, pointing to them as points of reference, maybe gives us some idea of the approach you have to take in deciding how to revise them. Uh, uh, not speaking for all of our almost 800 federal judges, a number of them have found them to be a useful document. They don't do lots of cases. But I, I suppose in part you have to keep in mind your audience because you're going to try to lead them in some, in, in some, to some extent. So one audience is the courts. Uh, there are your professional staff whom you're also giving guidance to as well. Uh, to give them an overall framework that I think has to be supplemented with all sorts of interim operational detail. Uh, there's the larger business community and those who advise the business community. Nathan was mentioning before, it's an important audience as well. And I think the, the clarity of the guidance is important. Uh, as, as the AAG has said on a number of occasions, uh, we're not talking simply to people inside the loop that's called the Beltway. We are making a broader statement, seeking to make a broader statement to a larger public as well. Uh, part of which is the business community, but to a larger public to make clear what our intentions are and to carry those, carry those out. All audiences to keep in mind in, in, in deciding how to, how to frame the document. Um, maybe we could come uh, to a point that, that Dan raised before. Uh, we've got a lot of merger jurisprudence, but it's interesting in what the flow of the jurisprudence has been. The last time the US Supreme Court weighed in on a matter of substantive merger policy was 1975. That's almost 50 years ago. Uh, I took the basic antitrust course in 1975, and I, I wonder what would have happened if my instructor had said, study the cases in this book. It was a current compilation of all of the Supreme Court jurisprudence, because the Supreme Court is not coming back on any of these issues in a merger case for a half century. Maybe sometime in the 2020s, you'll see a merger case in the Supreme Court again. But it hasn't happened. There were times when it seemed as though they would. But the Department of Justice, for example, after Baker Hughes decided to stay on the canvas, let the ref count to 10, and let the match end there instead of getting up and fighting on through the, through the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court's been silent. And in many ways, the jurisprudence developed between 1962, Brown Shoe, up through the early 70s, uh, doesn't look a great deal in some ways like existing enforcement policy. It certainly doesn't look like the jurisprudence from the lower courts in this period since 1975. Some embrace, cite, rely on the earlier jurisprudence features of it, the st famous structural presumption. Others don't. Uh, Dan, whose jurisprudence deserves how much weight in rewriting these guidelines? So I'm going to answer that in terms of Law School 101, which is that the Supreme Court decisions control. And for me, the way, especially the way I view uh, merger law and antitrust more broadly, is that just because that the Supreme Court has been, as you say, silent on this issue since 1975, the General Dynamics decision, doesn't mean that those cases go away. Those cases still exist. And in, now, I, I, and I agree with you, Bill, that we may see, you know, the um, the court uh, take an interest in merger law to actually say, you know, after after 50 years, we're gonna we're gonna take a stance, and I think there's a lot of predictions about what that stance could be. Um, it's been a long time since even there's been a petition to the Supreme Court. Just uh, actually, just yesterday, I did a, a quick Westlaw search, and I if I would, I would hope someone could correct me if I'm wrong here, but the last real petition on a substantive decision uh, that where the Supreme Court was petitioned on a merger was in the Polypore case in 2012 or 15, one of those. Um, so it's, it, there doesn't even seem to be an interest <laughs> uh, to petition the court on a, substan on a substantive matter. So um, yeah, I, for me, the, the Supreme Court's decisions, they matter, and they, they should be really be the guiding principle here. And I think it's, uh, some people would say, uh, you know, the lower court, it, as you said, Bill, sorry, um, this, the lower court's decision is not reflective of what the Supreme Court would say. I, I consider that a form of uh, 
as what I think is an accurate way to describe uh, really the past 40 years of merger enforcement, uh, is, a, is a bit of lawlessness. I mean, that is insane. When you say to someone, or if you, when the public recognizes, oh, the Supreme Court's decisions are not being followed, that, that's, that's law school 101, that this, those decisions matter, that the, what the Supreme Court is really the guiding point, uh, whether, they, whether it seems to be dicta or not, or whether it's a strict command on things. And there are certain themes that, again, I think we'll get into broader discussions about um, that the courts have repeatedly emphasized in their decisions that should be the main considerations when uh, a, a merger is being litigated. And it's, again, it's, it's, it's strange indeed that those, those considerations are thrown by the wayside. Is, is that civil disobedience on the part of the lower courts or a realistic assessment of how the Supreme Court itself is changing its views about the antitrust system? I, I would say that it, it is more on the disobedience side. Again, for the way I'm thinking about this is, is that just because the court hasn't said anything recently doesn't mean that those decisions don't exist. They're there. They're controlling. And in my view, again, the court is happy. And they've had many, many, many opportunities to, again, they can pick their own docket. If they really cared about something, they can say, you know what? We're going to pick up a case. And, and even more so, they could they even pick the issues, <laughs> right? They pick the issues they even want to discuss in a case, uh, or can extend a extend a decision uh, in any way they would like. So to me, there's um, I don't know whether there's a recognition that they don't they maybe they feel like they don't need to speak on this issue, but in in my view, those those cases matter and they should be vigorously adhered to. Nathan, what? What do you think has, what sorts of values, concepts, principles have to appear in guidelines for them to be credible instruments of policymaking over time and to be sustainable elements of policymaking? I think that's a really good question. Um, so economics as a discipline, I think is good at following rules that are clear. Um, we don't have to agree that the rules were correctly decided upon, but as long as they're clear, we can set up a problem, look for the objective function, take our first order conditions, a term you guys all know and it's right on the top of your lips whenever you're thinking about how to get to the best outcome, uh, and figure out what the implications are likely to be. Um, so, you know, I think clear rules are helpful in terms of guidelines. I think if we want these things to be maximally constructive, however, in terms of leading to better outcomes for society and for you know, likely to be relatively durable across different, um, across different administrations and political regimes, it'd be nice if the objective function was something that had broad uh, kind of agreement as being useful and correct. Um, and in this regard, and I will uh, uh, put in a word for the you know, sometimes excoriated consumer welfare standard, which I think is contrary to the views of some. Where would we be without it? I mean, just as a subject of discussion, I think we'd be lost. We certainly would have less to talk about. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a relatively well-defined construct. construct. Um, it's essentially the, you know, the, the surplus, the benefit that is captured by consumers. Um, and that is, you know, in economics, pretty cleanly identifiable. It is shifted by price, certainly, but it's also shifted by product quality, uh, product assortment, other factors that we can relatively cleanly measure and incorporate into an analysis. Does it pick up innovation, in your view? Yes, it does. Yes, it Dynamic does. effects. Sure, these things, I'm not saying these things are easy, but the framework naturally accommodates their inclusion allowing one to you know, write down a problem that is internally consistent and coherent, and then we can you know, look for solutions that lead to that pool of benefit being captured by the public increasing and try and work towards things that lead to that. Um, so I mean that's, so I think that as a, as a focus makes a great deal of sense for the guidelines, and then writing down it, the best practices that we have as a, as a bar and a pool of practitioners, um, including judges, in terms of the assessment for the factors that you know, point towards 
uh, getting to the, this, these outcomes that we think on average are likely to be better. In your view, does it pick up a number of concerns related to the effect of transactions on labor markets, markets for talent? So I do. Um, so I think I think there has been no uh, view at the agencies, at least during my time there, that the sell side markets are uh, unimportant and not relevant for the consideration of mergers. Like there's reference in the 2010 guidelines as to these things. You know, is there scope for there to be more attention? I think reasonable people can can agree that maybe there could be. But it's not the case that these issues were ignored or never pursued in, in investigations. I think candidly, from my personal perspective, I think we shouldn't go overboard in looking at them. I don't know that the empirical literature in economics suggests that there are enormous, um, you know, there's an enormous and consistent evidence of monopsonistic outcomes from mergers. Uh, but again, I think reasonable people can disagree on that evidence. But I, so yeah, I, I think the consumer welfare standard definitely incorporates those aspects um, and there's no internal tension there. Yeah, I, I, I find a, a terrible difficulty in the discussions about the topic to be the elusive quality in many ways of what consumer welfare means. Uh, I, I'm afraid in many discussions, the moment you mention it, people drop the gloves and start fighting right away. It's uh, it's. It's hard to start out without the more elaborate definition, but I think the elements that you've pointed out here, Nathan, suggest that it's, it's not a single-minded focus on price effects, uh, nor arguably has it ever been. I, I think that's unambiguously correct, from, at least from the perspective of the economic discipline um, from which it is drawn. So I, I, I don't, don't mean to be authoritative about this, but I feel pretty strongly that consumer surplus as a general standard, or consumer welfare as a general standard, sweeps in things like innovation, quality, uh, you know, dynamic issues, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's, uh, in, on my part, that it's uh, um, a tunnel-visioned or myopic view of things, but when I look back at what the agencies have done over time, and I look at congressional testimony in particular, I don't recall anyone sitting before a legislative committee and saying it's just about price. And if asked, who's supposed to get the benefits? Are distributive considerations relevant? I don't know if an FTC chair said, we don't give a damn. That is, it's great for us if it all goes in the pockets of the shareholders and the managers. That's terrific. Nobody ever said that. Uh, the idea that benefits do have to flow through to purchasers of goods and services was always part of the testimony. To say otherwise was a good formula for having your budget request simply cast aside. So I, I like to think that it's a bit more encompassing sometimes than, than we think in the past. Um, uh, on, on this point again of what, you know, you think of what has to be in there. Uh, I think of the original Brandeisian, that's Brandeis himself, uh, the Chicago Board of Trade case is so informative. Uh, he talks about price and output. He talks about whether there were competitive effects, talks about price, talks about output. They're the anchors of his opinion. He said, these are the kinds of effects that we're looking at. He doesn't say these are the only effects, but he was certainly concerned about these. Um, and, uh, and I wonder, in, in the modern era, you have, you have two powerful cases in the 60s that suggested that efficiency considerations are irrelevant. Brown Shoe's one of them, or at least mitigated greatly by the concern of preserving an egalitarian environment in which small and medium enterprises can, can succeed. That's the end of the brown shoe opinion. And then Procter & Gamble that basically says, on a good day, they're irrelevant. On a bad day, they count against you. You're telling a predation story if you say you're doing better. Um, I wonder, in light of what the court has said since, if you could, could you write a version of the guidelines that says, efficiencies, we just don't care. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, Dan on the, on the Lumina, uh, the interesting opinion that the commission issued earlier this week, um, exhaustive analysis. Um, I'm wondering what would have happened if the commission, would the commission have been minded to say, uh, vertical transaction, brown shoe has a lot to say about vertical transactions and Ford Autolite. And we don't have to say very much here. 
the foreclosure is overwhelming, entry unlikely, and all of this efficiency stuff you're telling us, absolutely irrelevant. 200 single space pages could have been condensed to a long discussion of the facts, but the discussion of the law may have been 10 single space pages and we're out of here. The commission didn't do that. They did talk about the lower court jurisprudence. Dan, could the commission, if, if, you, if, you, if you wanted to be a little bit edgy in writing opinions, could you have said, I don't have to pay attention to this other stuff. You've got the court's clear guidance on these points. The rest of it is noise in the background. So, so yes, I actually think that, yes, that you don't, you shouldn't need all that analysis. And I also want to add that uh, Philadelphia National Bank also came in to dis, um, uh, discredit efficiencies. They had that, that very famous line. They had to be same market efficiencies, yeah, perhaps. Had, yeah, cr yeah, credit is a uh, famous line is a uh, credits and debits that, that there's no, uh, yeah. um, so it's really three separate times that the, uh, the Supreme Court has Again, call it generous, has been skeptical of efficiencies as well, but more, I think, fair to it has been, has said that efficiencies don't matter. And I think there's, but I just, I want to take a second just to describe what is that about, the, the lack of efficiencies. And it's because the court is trying to effectuate a critical part of our uh, merger, uh, merger law, which is to say that companies should internally expand, that they, sh that that practice of taking of spending your own money <laughs> and expanding your services has more social benefits to society which is really what we're really talking about here we're not just talking about two individual firms in, in engaging in competition we're really talking about how these companies operate in the broader market of competition the broader economy and that the court is trying to effectuate that companies should engage in behavior that is socially beneficial um, I, I do think that, again, to answer the question more succinctly, yes, that there, it, it maybe doesn't need to be 10 pages, but when you look at the court's jurisprudence, they care very deeply about the relevant market, which is a, which should be, as the court uh, has refined over many, many, many opinions, should be deeply fact intensive, where both litigants are given a, a lot of opportunity to describe what are the actual trade realities of competition that they're engaged in, and then we can then assess market power, i.e. market share, and that the court has given exceptional guidance in terms of how, how much market share is allowed, and there you go. And for me, when I think about that, yes, is that simple? Of course it is. But what does that mean for the broader business community that has to deal with, <laughs> or to at least tolerate the law, is that, that is that in that clarity, they can then know what they have to do as business people dealing with the day ins and day outs of business, which are difficult, um, but they can spend their time and money and resources and energy and many sleepless nights into engaging in doing work that helps make their company succeed, give their workers benefits, et cetera, and, but know that in the back of their head they have a deep sense of clarity uh, or at least a much clearer picture about what the law is, and that really allows them to do, then do what they need to do. Dan, do you think the, the, the new guidelines, should the new guidelines uh, again, to be faithful to this jurisprudence, should the new guidelines say, in PAPST, the Supreme Court said that a post-acquisition market share of 4.49% establishes the presumption of illegality. Should these guidelines say that? Uh, so I, I, I am not wise enough to figure out exact, to, or at least to pick exactly what the market share thresholds should be. I think that, um, I think the 1968 merger guidelines give a very good indicator of the kinds of market the kinds of market shares. There's a nice little uh, for those that those that read them. They're still on the <laughs> Department of Justice website for for your viewing pleasure, and they have a nice little table that says what is the what does the acquiring firm have and what is the uh, market share and what does the acquired um, firm's market share have and that gives a uh, you know a, that and if you re breach those thresholds, then an enforcement action will likely be brought. Um, so in terms of specifics, I, 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 don't know, I don't know exactly, but I do think that in order to be faithful to what the jurisprudence says and to what the Supreme Court has said, um, I, I love the language in um, Philadelphia National Bank. I, I, I know that's often said, but, or it's often referenced, but the language there is just great in terms of saying it's clear to us, or, or I don't know if that's exactly, but it's very clear that the 30% threshold in their eyes was, was enough. 
that that was saying, you know what, we're going to take a pragmatic view. We're going to, we don't need to gauge in this heavy, deeply factual analysis. That this, that that sort of bright line rule is enough for us to say, you know what, this is going to be a merger that substantially lessens competition. I, to me, that's the interesting question about the faithfulness to the earlier jurisprudence is that Philadelphia National Bank drew the line at, at 30, said 30 is enough to trigger the structural presumption. They bring it way down in the, later in the decade, bonds into the sevens and then perhaps four and a half. Um, again, uh, Don Turner said, that's a little too tight and I'm going to simplify that grid that you described, Dan, basically brings it up to 10% uh, in a lot of markets. And I guess that is, uh, that, is the, that is the issue for the drafter of the guidelines, thinking about whose guidance is decisive here. Uh, do you pull those 68 guidelines out and put them into the current framework and say, we got it right then, and we strayed by walking away from that. That's where we should be. So something I, I think I want to address just one point uh, to, to, to what you just said is I think I'm, I'm, I've been really engaging in the history of the guidelines and how the guidelines came about. Uh, surprisingly little here, but I, I have no evidence to make this claim. But what I, what must have been in the back of we're in mind, a law school. You don't need any. <laughs> well, but uh, what, unless this right. is a job talk, and you certainly don't need any. Go ahead. Uh, but what must have been in the background of the of when the, the first set of guidelines in 1968 were issued was that oh, there's always private enforcement, that these guidelines are for our guidance to the public, the federal government's guidance to the public about how we are going to enforce. There's obviously thousands of mergers taking place that we, it's not physically possible for us to take all of them. And just to get some sort of management done, just to say, you know what, how can we differentiate between those mergers that can be left to the broader private enforcement, which under Section 4 of the Clayton Act, and this was before the in, uh, transformation with the you know injury and uh, in standing you know Brunswick uh, Associated General Contractors Associated General Contractors etc. and that we are going to make a statement in terms of how we can enforce it. So I, again, I don't know if I don't know if I have I have yet to find evidence in terms of how Section Four of the Clayton Act played a role or in private enforcement played a role in the broader enforcement guidelines. But that must have been thinking about why they selected may have selected the um, the thresholds that they did, knowing that oh. For these other mergers that are more in line with Pabst and Bonds and Brown Shoe, et cetera, that they could be left to uh, more of the private enforcement that's left. Now, Nathan, uh, one of the arguments made for a much tighter approach to enforcement, calling the game much tighter, walking back to some of the earlier structural presumptions, is that mergers, far more often than not, don't contribute much to society. There's a continuing theme that they generate lots of wealth for senior management, their advisors on the outside, they're great for academics to write about, but for the larger society, mergers don't deliver a great deal, and that the frequency with which predicted gains, efficiencies, actually are manifest in the market is rare. Just think about how often Time Warner wishes the government would have stopped it from carrying out a transaction that they did, whether it's AOL, AT&T, anything having to do with Time Warner, how often they would have said, God, I wish the Department of Justice or FTC would have stopped us cold. Um, what do we give up in terms of wealth creation? What do we give up if we start from the assumption that so, so much of the activity that we observe is, is not fruitful for the larger society? What do we lose if the efficiency considerations are dramatically subordinated? So that, that seems to be divorcing things now from a question of whether or not there's a change in competition from the merger. If it's just there are transactions costs, maybe there are integration costs that are wasteful. You know, If that's the concern, then we have other probably a need for legislation for new regulation that would just you know, cut that off. Um, that doesn't seem to me to be wise, but that is an option available to us if we just think mergers are bad, irrespective of their competitive consequences. So to me, as an antitrust person, it, it, we really should be thinking about, you know, does the line need to be drawn such that 
Um, we, do we think we've drawn the line such that anti-competitive deals are getting through on a regular basis? Uh, and I think there are, are reasonable arguments about that. I, my former colleague Dan Hoskin, or my former colleague Dan Hoskin, has a nice paper with Orly Ashenfelter at uh, Princeton, you know, where they're trying to look at the competitive effects yeah. of transactions that were real close to the enforcement margin but went through. And they find, I think, you know, one and a half, two percent price effects. So maybe these deals on average weren't great. It didn't, I mean, my takeaway from that is not, is that the line isn't radically off, right? We, we haven't, we're not grossly under enforcing based on like, limited analysis, single paper, carefully done, but single paper. Um, so I think I would be leery about uh, radically redrawing that line based on what I think are you know, theoretically driven, but largely normative priors. Um, and I think that one can point to you know, solid evidence in the economics literature and finance literature that a large amount of new business creation is, you know, occurs with at least one of the potential termination or routes of exit for those investors being the acquisition of a, by another firm for whom their assets are complementary, right? And if we cut that option for exit, profitable exit off, we're going to dry up to at least some extent. I think reasonable people can disagree about the extent to which there would be a drying up of investment, but I think it would occur. Um, and to me, as someone who I who thinks about the long run effects being really important, uh, fostering growth, um, you know, cutting off innovative investment seems like a really unfortunate uh, side effect. Um, of pursuing a you know, potentially laudatory goal, but one that is not clearly borne out by the existing empirical evidence. I mean, they're, they're, if you're the drafters of the new document, and it's taking a while, uh, probably won't, that draft may not be released until the early summer, June. 30 day comment period, 60 day comment period. Um, the final revised document, maybe not out until the autumn, um, September, uh, after Labor Day for, for a North American audience here. Um, so still work to be done. When it comes out, uh, do could, could both of you think for a bit, and I'll give you my own list too, about things you want to see in that document? Things that are in the previous documents that you want to see, a handful of themes that you want to see, elements of analytical technology that you want to see carried forward. What do you want to preserve? And I'll ask you later, what do you want to change? But what do you want to keep? What do you want, what do you want continued? Things that have added to the quality of analysis that you, that you want there, Dan? I, again, I'm not really sure if I would want to keep a, a, a good chunk. Uh, there's a great article in Competition Policy International that came out in 2010 uh, about the 2010 merger guidelines. And it has a, a really wonderful line in there about, uh, you know, it gives a good overview of what actually the guidelines say. And, but it has this really wonderful line that it's, it goes something along the lines of, it's clear that economists came out on top with this, with this iteration. And for me, the way I think about that is that that's not who's the law, that's not what the law is for. Uh, they are not supposed to be the primary beneficiaries of what the law is, the public is. Um, and so I, if anything, I would wanna see, I would wanna see a lot change. Like I said earlier, I would, I would wanna see a lot more articulation of the jurisprudence, a lot more articulation of what the goals were, whether it's uh, the formation of small businesses, local control of businesses, a clear concern with, uh, I, I would actually, I would say an overwhelming concern with um, uh, a, a tendency uh, to create monopoly or a, a, a trend towards consolidation, uh, not just the uh, drafters of the 1950 amendment, but also the court made repeated uh, citations to that, not just in Brown Shoe and Vons and, and, and Philadelphia National Bank, but in Pabst and the, re and the rest of the cases. And then more, perhaps just as importantly, is the host of, uh, district court cases that were affirmed by the Supreme Court in procurium opinions. The, some of them are Times Mirror, Kendigott Copper. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's like a, another one, Phillips Petroleum. Uh, there's a, a whole a slew of them 
where the court was saying, you know what, yeah, these, this is right. <laughs> uh, and so you also have to factor, factor that in. I would love to see in the guidelines citations to those cases, because they also, they also matter where the Supreme Court gave their stamp of approval, not just in terms of the analysis that went into analyzing the market share and the, and the competition between the companies, but also even how they defined relevant markets in a very qualitative manner, looking at evidence, looking at uh, you know, consumer surveys, et cetera. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to see that that articulated. And again, in detail, as it should, because again, I, I'll, I'll say, again, gui guidelines should provide guidance. <laughs> it should be, they should be clear, and a lot of this stuff is complicated, right? These, ca these cases, that they, the courts say a lot of information. They ca you can sort of categorize it. What did they say about trend toward consolidation? What did they say about incipiency? What did they say about small businesses? And I would love to see just an art, uh, uh, organized in that manner. Here's what we are taking from the court, and here's how, then, going into how we can uh, effectuate that through a, a, a vigorous uh, enforcement process. Nathan, what do you think should be carried forward? That is, what have we, what in your view have we learned that we've done well that ought to anchor the new document? Uh, what are the must-have retention items? That's a great question, Bill. Um, it's not one that I'd thought of precisely in those terms before. Uh, so forgive me if I'm incoherent, or more incoherent even than usual. Um, it's, again, it's a law school. That doesn't get held against you. It's OK. Just don't say that first. You're from Washington. You just say it. You don't have to mention incoherence. Let the audience figure that out. No, it's OK. Thank you for the Students, students uh, never figure it out until it's too late. It's OK. Much appreciated. Um, so I think one of the things that I Just kidding. So I, so I may, may be in a minority position. I think the 2010 guidelines are pretty good, pretty helpful. Um, I think Daniel Francis, who's a professor at NYU and Antitrust, has a, a recent CPI article uh, where he talks, you know, it's a, it's a useful document. Are there things that could usefully be changed? Sure, it's 12 years old. Of course, we might focus a little bit more on this and a little less on that. I, I come down in a very similar position to Daniel. Um, Thinking about specifics, so I have. I think it's a, one of the laudable things about the 2010 guidelines was the explicit focus on effects. Clearly, we care about market definition. It's in case law. It's useful for judges in, in terms of understanding, you know, the, the the scenario and the institutions that they're focused on. But ultimately, that's not really the purpose of the antitrust investig investigatory enterprise. We care about the potential consequences of this of a given deal and to the extent that the investigation and the litigation can focus on those effects so much the better now i think in practice uh that aspect of the guidelines has been more um you know mentioned than honored in how litigation has actually proceeded there has still been a i think from my perspective excessive focus on market definition relative to the competitive effects um, but I would like to see in the new ones a continued emphasis that look, the point of this is to care about what will happen if this merger goes through, or excuse me, what we think will happen, what is likely to happen. Um, and I hope, that, I hope that shows up in the new ones. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, if I think the things that have been very useful for enforcement, uh, the refinement of the unilateral effects theory has been a great tool for enforcement. Uh, it's, I guess to put it in one crude way, coming forward from 92, it's enabled agencies to take what might seem at first glance at 11 to 10 or 10 to 9 mergers and turn them into 3 to 2. Uh, um, not in a cynical way, but to say this is the niche that really matters, so we're going to focus on that. And you, I don't think you'd want to pitch that over the side. Uh, I'd like to see an elaboration to take the other main theory of, of coordinated effects. Uh, when I look at the literature on cartel behavior, uh, I'm struck at how many discovered cartels, we don't know about the undiscovered ones, but the discovered cartels involve eight or more participants. Uh, a lot of this comes out of the European experience, but it's eight or more. Um, a stunning percentage of them, along with uh, a, a related literature that says the, the technology and means that Firms that want to engage in coordination pursue has been refined over time. It's an arms race. They don't give up. They gain leniency. They find other ways to do this. Uh, you know, whether it's Joe Harrington, whether it's uh, um, you know Bob Marshall, Leslie Marks, uh, 
looking at older cases, they've identified a number of areas where you can see that the invitation to look at coordinated effects somewhat more generously that appears in the 2010 guidelines might be carried forward some. I'd like to see that, that uh, literature reflected uh, with the main, the main view being that uh, coordination happens at thresholds that don't involve getting down to four to three or, or three to two. It happens above that, which means that the uh, concern about coordination and a number of other instances ought to be taken more seriously. I would take a bloody-minded approach to firms that have been involved in cartels in the past. Uh, I'd say if you've, uh, if you've, if you've been caught before, uh, good luck on getting the next one through, um, just as a, a consequence of the, of the cartel enforcement program. I guess, I guess another thing I'd like to see is if the, if the goals framework is elaborated and we go back and anchor uh, the, the jurisprudence uh, the anchors of the jurisprudence from Brown Shoe, which I, I find to be one of the most interesting cases, and it always rewards uh, a rereading. Brown Shoe has the famous discussion at the end of the opinion that talks about the, the vertical dimensions of the merger, where the main efficiency pitch was you're going to take what was largely a manufacturing company with about 5% of total production and join it up, with, which was mainly a retailer, that was Kinney, with a foreclosure effect of 2% or less, quaint numbers given current practice, but uh, post-acquisition horizontal share of about five and a half maybe, the vertical foreclosure 2% or less. And the theory was you're gonna take the, 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 the better manufacturing company and join to it a better retailing network and you're gonna sell more shoes, more men's, women's, and children's shoes, higher output, lower price, and the party's uh, expectation, I think, was that that's going to be the benefit of the transaction. And the Supreme Court says, we are not saying that vertical integration is always a bad thing. We don't deny the benefits. However, we cannot fail to acknowledge the direction of Congress to preserve an environment in which small and medium enterprises are more likely to thrive. And the Congress was willing to give up some benefit in terms of cost prices for the benefit of achieving this. If I'd been in the room when the court read the opinion, they didn't, they just issued it. I'd have said, would you take a question? Okay, you're willing to give up some additional cost increase for the sake of this environment. How much? 10% more for shoes? 20% more for shoes? Here are the people coming in the door. Um, in this store, you will be charged 20% more, but, it will create an environment in which SMEs can thrive. Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, which store do you want to go into? The court dodges the trade-off completely. It's able to escape by just saying some, and the suggestion is it's a small amount. Well, how much would you ignore? Uh, I'd like to see that trade-off specified, what methodology you're going to use, if you're going to use it in the guidelines, and certainly when you write a decision, the related practice is, I want you to tell me what you're doing. I want you to tell me which values you're emphasizing. I wanna know how much weight you're giving to each value. You've gotta be completely transparent. You can't hide behind uncertainty or doubt about what you've gotta, if it were a math exam, you gotta show your work from the top all the way to the bottom. I say that from the cheap seat of an academic, realizing that when I was in an enforcement agency and you had to write those decisions and opinions, that makes you nervous, especially when you're not quite sure what the trade-offs are. But part of me says, I don't care what values you want to pack into the process. Although, going back to Brandeis and Chicago Board of Trade, I'd like to see price, quantity, later cases that talk about Innovation, quality, I want to see all of that there. Add what you like, but you've got to tell me how you're doing it. I don't want you to hide factors. Spell them out for me so that I can form my own assessment about whether you're using the multivariable process. That's not so much something you can build directly into the guidelines. That is a commitment that an agency would make later to the transparency of its process, but I would like to see not just in guidelines, but later, later, later practice. Um, I know we are bumping right up against our, 
our stop time. I guess as moderators, we can just go on and dismiss the other panel and tell them to go home. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions here on this tablet. All right. Okay. I'm not seeing additional questions. Here's one. Why don't you guys take the rest of the afternoon and keep talking? Well, we have another panel. That wouldn't be wouldn't be appropriate. Um, uh, let's see. I don't see additional questions here, but maybe maybe we can go around for a, a closing comment on anything you'd like to elaborate or something we haven't touched on that you'd like to to bring out. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, something I I, I really like your acknowledgement of the. Brown shoe case. I, I will second that. It's a truly fascinating opinion, and I, opinion, and I think everyone should read it. It's a uh, a, a really superb uh, um, attempt by the court to understand what we, or that rather they, should do with this broad set of uh, prohibitions Congress set on mergers, and they really, really try to set out a uh, a deep understanding of what Congress tried to do. Um, and I, I, I emphasized earlier about the one of the reasons why the court was very strict on mergers is to facilitate uh, Congress's uh, legislative directive on um, internal expansion. And the court gives a truly uh, fascinating footnote that I, I really do wish was in the main opinion, uh, as, as <laughs> I'm sure many of the law students uh, here uh, over, uh, skip over the footnotes. That is, a, that is a mistake, and it shouldn't be done, but it often does. Especially in antitrust. Yes, yes, yes. The footnotes are uh, notoriously important. Um, but I just, uh, I, I just want to read a, a section of it, because it, it's really sublime what the, the court uh, emphasized in terms of the, the difference between growth by merger and growth by internal expansion. And it said, internal expansion is more likely to be the result of increased demand for the company's products and more likely to provide increased investments in plants, more jobs, and greater output. And really what the court is getting at there is that, if a, it, that businesses should take the risk instead of using their access to, you know, privileged access to capital, their, their dominant position there, uh, or their intent to seek to crush their competitors, and instead, you know what? Take the risk and engage in behavior that is socially beneficial. Engage in behavior from which society can benefit off of the productive actions that you're going to engage in. And again, the court would go on to repeat that statement, but I, I, I really think that that part of it, I think, puts into a broader context about why mergers should be restricted, about what is the, one of the, again, there's many reasons why, whether it's harm to jobs, et cetera, uh, but what the court was really trying to emphasize there was saying, no, that limits on mergers actually produce social good, that companies can do much better without this. And again, and I just want to, I'll probably end with, I'll end with this, that the court didn't want to ban all mergers, and neither did Congress. They wanted to, to prohibit many mergers, and but they did not want to prohibit all of them. Um, they, the court makes great strides to emphasize that particular point. But in terms of why, the general understanding of why mergers are bad, it's because there is, that companies can do better. They can engage in behavior that is beneficial for everyone. Nathan. Um, so given the, the focus of the symposium in particular, I thought I would maybe comment briefly on whether or not we need kind of have different presumptions, different norms surrounding digital transactions. Sure. Um, and I think my answer there would be a pretty strong no, that I think we should have a set of rules that apply to mergers in general, um, and then the particular analysis of mergers should take into account the particularities of the industries involved. Right? We don't have separate norms for healthcare. We don't have separate norms for, for other types of manufacturing. I don't think we need clear, to write different uh, rules for digital industries. You know, just as with any of these other types, the particularities will be influenced by whether or not competition is you know, one-sided or two-sided. So the analysis should take those factors into account when we you know, assess whether or not it seems likely to result in some substantial lessening of competition with adverse effects for consumers. Um, and perhaps that will lead us to conclude that there should be, you know, just an, the average probability of an enforcement action, maybe that should differ across industries, but the rules themselves should be, you know, equally, equally applied. I'll turn it over to Bill. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I think as a strategic judgment, one of the hardest things that an agency faces in writing this kind of document is how to make it sustainable. Uh, that means that uh, the effectiveness of the document depends on people who will be at the agency after you're gone. Maybe a regime change that brings in new people. Uh, is it going to be sustainable in the eyes of judges who come to like the document that's out there now? And are you going to stand in front of them and say, everything you know is wrong, we're sorry, we misled you, but it's all been a big mistake. Uh, do you want to tell them that? Uh, especially saying, no, but we've got it right now. Um, why should I trust you if you... It's a problem with the 40 years of failure speech, which is uh, we've been delusionally wrong for four decades, but we've awoken, we're now having a lucid interval, and you can trust me right now. Um, how much would you trust a system that could be so systematically failed for that long? I'm not sure I would. And I'm not sure I'd trust the person who said, but I've got it right now. I, I, so, so how you, as, as one commentator said in looking at the, the earlier guidelines experience, you can lead the courts. You can't abandon them, though. And if you run away from a methodology that they found to be useful, that's going to be very jarring. Uh, next, uh, you have to write guidelines that assume that, unless you think you're going to win a lot of elections and have a continued appointment of people who think about the way you do, which doesn't happen in our system, by the way, not consistently, unless it's the beginning of the Franklin Roosevelt administration, you get it four terms. Nope, uh, not even that can be done anymore. Um, you have to assume that in the relay race model, you're going to hand the baton to somebody else, and you are they going to stay on the track? Are they going to run hard and then hand it off to someone else? Uh, it's got to be appealing. You have to think about whoever that is. Are they going to look at my document and say, is this compelling in terms of its analysis, its historical perspective that Dan was referring to? Are you using a technology that seemed to have worked before that you want to keep? Um, I, I, think, I think it suggests that you might not be able to accomplish a cosmic change in the document. You can move in another direction, but if you're not attentive to these historical tendencies, um, you, you, you outrun some of these audiences that you, that you want, including maybe a legislature that is, can be ever so fickle in its, uh, in its preferences and desires. Uh, it's, uh, uh, one colleague said it's like uh, mountain climbing in the mountains. Uh, in the morning, it's 10 in the morning, it's blue skies and sunshine. By 2 p.m., it's a driving hailstorm. And uh, weather changes fast. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to testify in front of the legislative committee and say, we're not going to look at efficiencies anymore. They're out. We're just not going to look at it anymore. Uh, would they be seen as, uh, as, as sustainable? But uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that we got a chance to, to, to look ahead and talk about what this uh, document's going to look like. And uh, please join me in thanking Dan and Nathan for illuminating these questions so well. Um, and I think we have a microscopic break now until 2.10 when we reserve with the next panel. Resume.